Have any of you seen the movie Miss Congeniality with Sandra Bullock? Well, there's a scene in the film where there's a beauty pageant. An interviewer asks the beauty pageant contestants what they want, and they all say, world peace. Right? And world peace is supposed to be a joke, right? It's supposed to be naive and impossible, and it's a joke. So do you see the problem there? If you believe that world peace is naive, and it's impossible, and it's a joke, how can you ever move in that direction? If you believe that world peace is naive and impossible and a joke, then war becomes inevitable. And w if war is inevitable, then why not be the best at it? If world peace is naive and world peace is a joke, and war is inevitable, then you have two options. You can be the conqueror, or you can be the conquered, right? But if we talk about whether world peace is possible, then maybe new possibilities could arise. So I can tell you what I thought about world peace when I was growing up, because I didn't grow up in the peace movement. So for a long time, I thought that world peace was a naive dream. My father served in the army for 30 years, and he fought in the Korean and Vietnam wars. My mother lived in Japan during World War II, and she lived in Korea during the Korean War. I graduated from West Point. I served in the army for seven years. I was deployed to Baghdad, and I left the army just two years ago as a captain. So I grew up very skeptical of this whole peace thing, very skeptical, thinking it was naive and impossible. But what if I told you that I learned at West Point and in the Army that world peace is possible? Furthermore, a simple question can help us understand whether world peace is possible or whether world peace is a naive dream. And that question is, are human beings naturally violent or naturally peaceful? If human beings are naturally violent and war is something they were supposed to do, then it would be naive to assume that world peace could ever happen. But if human beings are naturally peaceful, and we have to be trained and conditioned to become violent, then world peace just might be possible. World peace just might have a chance. So please raise your hand if you think human beings are naturally violent. Only a couple people. Very optimistic group. Raise your hand if you think human beings are naturally peaceful. Okay. Please raise your hand if you think human beings are naturally violent and naturally peaceful. Okay. Most hands go up on that one typically. And we'll talk about that. But it's actually very counterintuitive. It's a very counterintuitive idea. And I'll give you a couple other examples of very counterintuitive ideas. Let's say you, let's say you were to go back 2,000 years and try to convince someone 2,000 years ago that the Earth goes around the sun. Would that be an easy or hard thing to do 2,000 years ago to convince somebody that the Earth goes around the sun? Would that be easy or hard? It'd be very hard. Because if the Earth goes around the sun, why don't we feel a sense of motion? Why don't we feel movement, right? And you can't tell people back then it's like being on a plane or on a train because there are no planes or trains, right? And if you're on a horse or if you're on a boat, it's bumpy. So why don't we feel motion? Why does it feel like everything is still? And when you look out at the sky, why does it look like everything is going around you? If you look up, everything's moving around me. I'm not moving around anything else. And here's another counterintuitive idea. If you were to go back 2,000 years ago and try to convince people that the Earth is round, would that be an easy or hard thing to do? It would be a very hard thing to do. Because if the Earth is round, if the Earth is like a ball and the Earth is round, why don't the people on the bottom of the Earth fall off? Why don't the people on the sides slide off, right? If the Earth is round, why, when I walk for miles and miles and miles, why does it seem flat? So these are very counterintuitive. And another counterintuitive idea is we're not naturally violent. But if we're not naturally violent, why is there so much war? Why is there genocide? Why is there murder, right? And another counterintuitive idea, there was a qu question earlier during the panel. Somebody said that 68% of Americans support war, right? But we actually have to look a layer, a layer deeper than that question. When you hear a statistic like 68% of Americans support war, what that is really saying is 68% of Americans think that war makes them safe and protects their family, right? That's why you can't talk about the military budget with most people, because in their mind, war protects my family, and war protects my freedom, and war protects my way of life, and war protects my children. And war has become synonymous with security, right? And the reality, especially in the 21st century, is that war actually makes us less safe. Not only does not war not make us safe, war makes us less safe. Now, if you convince people of the reality that war not only doesn't make us safe, but makes us less safe, now how many percent of people are going to actually support war? If you can go through that illusion, right? And it's actually very counterintuitive, because you think that the more you project military force, the safer you are. 
But the more you project military force, the less safe you are. It's counterintuitive the way the Chinese finger trap is counterintuitive. The more you pull, the more stuck your fingers get. You think that if you pull hard, you'll get loose, but the more you pull, the more stuck you get. So we'll talk about all this. And I want to talk about it by asking all of you a question. What is the greatest problem of every army in world history? Every army in world history, no matter what time period or culture, has a single greatest problem. Can any of you guess what that problem is? Every army's greatest problem. Getting people to kill. Getting people to kill. Great answer. And that is a big problem. Keep in mind, armies have lots of problems. Food, supply, logistics, recruiting. The problem I'm talking about is even bigger than the opposing army. Because if you don't solve this problem, you won't have a chance to fight the army on the other side. And getting soldiers to kill is a big problem, but there's an even bigger problem than that. Anybody want to guess? Disease, disease and sickness. Oh, great answer. Disease, sickness, especially in ancient war. Very big problem, especially in ancient warfare. Any other thoughts? Yes. Oh, that, that, there you go. Right there. So the greatest problem of every army in world history isn't getting soldiers to kill, although that is a very big problem. It's getting soldiers to die. People don't want to die. People don't want to die a violent, horrible, painful death. People don't want to get stabbed. People don't want to get shot. People don't want to get blown up, right? If you look at combat, in combat, our flight response is far more powerful than our fight response. Most people's natural reaction, when you try to stab them with a sword or shoot them with a rifle, most people's natural reaction is to run away as fast as they can, as far as they can. Ask anyone who's been in combat and they will tell you it's terrifying. And General Patton said, anyone who says they're not afraid in combat is a liar. So people don't want to get stabbed or shot or blown up, right? If I go out, if I go out into the street and pull a shotgun on somebody or pull a knife on somebody, their instinct is to run from me, not to fight me. Most people. So how did armies throughout history learn to make soldiers fight and not retreat? Everything in your body says don't get stabbed, don't get shot, don't die. Don't get injured. How did armies throughout history learn to make soldiers fight and not retreat? Sense of camaraderie. Sense of camaraderie. There's many techniques the armies can use. But the single most effective technique, here's a way to make this very apparent. What would all of you die for? What would all of you die for? Raise your hand if you would risk your life to protect your family. Every hand goes up, right? Do you ever wonder why the army has the whole band of brothers and the camaraderie and the brotherhood? It's so that people won't retreat off the battlefield. And I think Lao Tzu, a Chinese philosopher, said it best when he said, by being loving, we are capable of being brave. The Greeks realized that if soldiers believe they are fighting to protect their friends, their family, and their loved ones, they will not only fight, but they will even sacrifice their lives. Because our instinct to protect our loved ones is far more powerful than our instinct for self-preservation. Think about how you would react if you saw your loved ones being attacked. Think about how you would rush to their aid and try to protect them. So I heard a story a few years ago on the radio that kind of illustrates this. Okay? And it was a story about an 80-year-old woman. And the 80-year-old woman was walking down the street, and there was a loose pit bull running toward her. So what would you do if you were walking down the sidewalk and there was a loose pit bull running toward you? What would you do? You'd want to run, right? Your instinct isn't to fight the pit bull. That's madness, fighting a pit bull. What if there's a tree right next to you? Climb a tree, right? What if there's a house right next to you? What would you do? Go in a house, right? The instinct to flee from a pit bull is more powerful than your instinct to fight a pit bull. But this story was about an 80-year-old woman, and she was walking her little poodle. And the pit bull ran up and clamped its jaws in her poodle, and the 80-year-old woman bent down and bit the pit bull on the neck until the pit bull let go. But doesn't that behavior make sense? Think about it. Think about how the dynamic changes. If the pit bull is coming toward you, your instinct is to flee. Self-preservation. But imagine a pit bull attacking your child, your son, your daughter, your granddaughter, your grandson, your brother, your sister, your parent, your best friend. Think about that situation. The dynamic completely changes. You lose concern for personal safety. And you would grab a rock or grab a stick and go hit the pit bull over the head even with no military training. If you see your loved one being attacked by a pit bull, the dynamic changes where you lose regard for personal safety, you go berserk, and you go and try to help your loved one, even at great risk to yourself. 
So armies require camaraderie and brotherhood in order to function. At West Point, I learned a famous passage from Shakespeare's Henry V, which reads, We few, we happy few, we band the brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. West Point also taught me to treat my military unit like my family. And your military unit becomes your family. You live with these people. And army training puts you in situations where you have to trust them with your life, where you have to sacrifice for each other, and where you can't get anything done without teamwork and cooperation. And that builds very strong bonds between people. So the army takes people from every background, every religious background, black people, white people, Hispanic people, and puts them together and trains them to be a family with this strong brotherhood. And they put them in a situation where people are trying to kill their family. And then people have to fight to protect their comrades and their family. And that's what effective military units do. They transform soldiers into brothers and into family. Have any of you seen the movie Forrest Gump? Why did Forrest Gump risk his life to save Bubba? Why did Forrest Gump risk his life to save Bubba? They were best friends, right? They were best friends. So armies make soldiers love each other and then they will die for each other. So do you see how that bond is very effective? So love of comrades is one psychological technique that the Greeks used to make soldiers fight and not retreat. Another psychological technique that the Greeks used was love of country. Love of country. Have any of you heard of the Battle of Thermopylae? Raise your hand if you've heard of the Battle of Thermopylae. Okay. Raise your hand if you've heard of the movie 300. Okay. When I ask students that question, everyone's heard of 300. The same battle, but 300 is not that realistic. But during the Persian War, the decisive battle was not the Battle of Thermopylae, where the Spartans were defending a pass against the Persians. The decisive battle was the Battle of Salamis, where the Athenian general Themistocles had to defeat a very large Persian navy with a very small Greek navy. So imagine how frightening it is to have one person trying to kill you. Now imagine being outnumbered 3 to 1, 4 to 1, 5 to 1. So the Athenians were greatly outnumbered. And to inspire the courage that made their victory possible, the Athenians shouted the following battle cry. Advance ye sons of Greece, from oppression save your wives, save your children, save your country. This day, the common cause of all demands your valor. Most people will die to protect their loved ones. I think many of you would die to protect your loved ones. So when the Athenians heard that, advance ye sons of Greece from oppression, save your wives, save your children, save your country. This day, the common cause of all demands your valor. They were ready to fight to the death. And I think that battle cry has been used by every government since then. Not word for word, but the essence of that battle cry. Because whenever a government wants to make a population go to war, they have to say that we're fighting to protect our freedom, or we're fighting to protect our way of life, or we're fighting to protect our friends, our family, and our loved ones. How many wars have there been in human history? How many wars have there been in human history? Too many to count, right? Maybe thousands. But do you know in all of world history, all of military history, there has never been a single war where a national leader told his people they're fighting for money or gold or oil? Every war in history is about what? Two things, self-defense and liberating people. Even Hitler claimed self-defense, right? But if we were naturally violent, why couldn't the national leaders just say, look, you all are naturally violent. I'm going to pay you to go kill people who are just like you. Nobody would fight. So imagine you're a poor Roman farmer. Imagine you're a poor Roman farmer. And the Roman emperor says to you, he says, look, I want you to go to war. And the worst case scenario for you is you die and your wife becomes a widow and your children become orphans. And the best case scenario for you is you come back to your farm. He's going to say, are you crazy? Why am I, why am I going to go do that? But what if the Roman emperor tells a farmer, look, if you don't go to war, these evil people in this faraway land are going to come kill your family and take away your farm and take away your freedom and take away your way of life. Then he's going to fight ferociously to protect his country, his people, his family, his way of life. But think about that. If human beings are naturally violent, why would the greatest problem of every army in world history be when a battle begins, how do you stop soldiers from running away? And why would governments have to manipulate our love in order to make us go to war?